All right, students. So uh, this is Mr. Moeller, and uh, welcome to uh, our e-learning classroom here. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about culture and social conflict uh, in the 1920s. But uh, we're going to start out with this. So uh, go ahead and pause the video. Um, I'll wait for a minute here. And uh, I want you to try to figure out uh, what this is, uh, why this is, and uh, just pause it and give yourself a couple minutes and uh, you know write down whatever you think this thing is. Well, if you figured out that uh, this is indeed a toilet, you are right. Uh, this is a urinal that is flipped upside down, uh, and it is a piece of artwork. Uh, in 1917, the artist Marc Child Duchamp uh, put this out in a facility and called, sorry, in an art gallery, and he called it Fountain. And so this kind of is a piece that is going to challenge what art is, right? Because art is supposed to be beautiful. Art is supposed to depict, you know, kind of like life scenes, flipping over a urinal and calling it art. Is that really art? In the, in the post-World War I era, these are questions that society is starting to ask. Uh, so that's why that is kind of our perfect intro into this time of the Roaring Twenties. So the Roaring Twenties is going to represent a very, very dramatic change. Uh, a change from the wartime into peacetime. A time in which many people are pushing for um, kind of access to political rights, cultural recognition. Um, and it's also an era in which um, society itself and culture and how people interact socially is going to go through a massive change. Uh, so explanation kind of a why they're the Roaring Twenties. Um, underpinning all this change is going to be the big economic boom that's going to happen post-war. Uh, industrialization is going to continue. Credit is going to be like really easily available. Um, and the stock market is going to really roar in this time as well. And so with a lot of money in their pockets, economic opportunities, and a lot of borrowed money, Americans give up on social crusades um, like progressivism, uh, like World War I's making the world safe for democracy, and they just want to return back to normal life where they can enjoy economic prosperity, all these new materials, and ultimately really kind of leave the past behind. Uh, the 1920s also kind of for us represents the rise of something called modernity. And so modernity, as opposed to kind of more traditional ways of thinking, is heavily um, into the idea of individualism. It also rejects tradition on the whole. Um, World War I, as you guys read uh, in some of those poems, the younger generation really starts to break with this idea of tradition as important. And so with that, um, kind of faith in science and technology is going to start to usurp uh, faith in kind of leaders and religion. And so there really is an obsession with now and new, and anything that is new is going to be assumed to be better if you are someone who ascribes to modernity. Um, so really after World War I, there are two attitudes that are out there about how to handle the experience that the world had just gone through. And so I'm going to break them down generally into two categories. There's going to be the lost generation, and there's going to be the age of play. And you can kind of summarize this as the intellectuals versus kind of the common people in the 1920s. So kind of starting with this idea of uh, Wilfred Owen's poem, Dulce et Decorum, asked, there's a sense among the young people that kind of they had been lied to their entire lives, that the war experience had kind of exposed these lies that they had been told. And so there's a really big rise in the attitude of cynicism after World War I, a general distrust in people's motive, kind of lack of hope, skepticism. And so a cynic, uh, as H.L. Mencken once said, is a man who, when he smells flowers, looks around, not for a wedding, not for a spring day, but for a funeral. And these themes show up a lot uh, in literature of the Great War. We looked a little bit at Alcoi on the Western Front. Um, if you're interested in looking at any of these other books, they also kind of deal with this war experience and how it's going to change the people who experience it. Um, movies also are going to pick up on this theme. Um, a couple of really great movies from the immediate uh, kind of aftermath of the war, All Quiet on the Western Front. There's a French film called Jacques Hughes, where the dead of World War I actually like rise from the grave to seek revenge. Um, and my personal favorite World War I movie, Jean Renoir's The Grand Illusion, that really digs deep into kind of how this war is going to change the social relationships between classes, uh, especially in Europe. So if you're bored, um, all these are are available on YouTube, I believe, so you can check them out. 
So just to kind of summarize um, what these people are getting at uh, with their literature and their film is that they kind of all believe that civilization is dead. Um, the Lost Generation is kind of called a funeral with many eulogies. Uh, eulogy is um, basically spoken at a funeral to commemorate um, the life of the person who died. And so a lot of people are just kind of writing about how society was collapsing, um, about how the values and traditions had kind of led the world into ruin. And uh, you kind of see that in The Great Gatsby. Um, also, Ernest Hemingway's novels uh, kind of drip with that idea, using bullfighting and the sun also rises to kind of symbolize kind of the pointless violence of the war. Um, and in the art world, um, a lot of people kind of start to move away from this idea that art should be beautiful, um, art should be traditional, and uh, they begin to say that, well, maybe art is meaningless. And so a couple of big movements, Dadaism and Surrealism, are going to crop up as a result. And then finally, in philosophy and in literature, existentialism becomes uh, kind of a very big philosophy. And so existentialism is going to kind of reject the idea of traditional religions that say that your life has kind of meaning. And it's going to say, basically, your life has no meaning apart from your own existence and whatever meaning you decide to give to it, whatever meaning you create. And so <laughs> this kind of leads into then the idea of absurdism that kind of argues that man's struggle is ultimately meaningless. And so there's a certain amount of, I guess, kind of dark humor in that fact. And there's also a lot of people around the world that are rejecting the idea of democracy, thinking it foolish and saying that kind of all the problems around the world were linked to the rise of democracy after World War I. And so there's a lot of people out there that are really kind of despairing in the 1920s after the experience of World War I. And so in the art world, what you see uh, is kind of the development of a few movements, abstract art, um, Dadaism. Basically, as you look at this, it kind of challenges you to make sense of it, right? What is it? What is it about? Is it about nothing? And so that kind of becomes big in the art world. Uh, surrealism, too, kind of breaking from the mold of painting kind of realistic scapes and things like that. Um, Salvador Dali especially begins to kind of bend this idea of reality that becomes a big theme in the 1920s. Um, 1921, Max Ernst, The Elephant. As you look at this, it's weird, right? Does it look like an elephant? Does it not? Would you have figured out it was supposed to be an elephant if you didn't have the title? So take a few minutes and look through these art pieces, and you'll kind of get a sense of the way people were starting to think um, a little bit more critically of tradition after the First World War. Uh, in Germany, Otto Dix uh, sets out to paint what he sees as uh, reality. And so uh, he paints uh, the crippled war veterans. Um, he paints people selling matches on the street. Uh, and these kind of nightmare scapes, he's kind of meant to emphasize the scars that the war had left in an era where people were trying to forget what had happened. Um, Pablo Picasso becomes big in this time. Um, he gets into his cubism phase. And so this has a really big impact on art around the world. Um, it also has an impact on theater and novels. Um, Kafka's The Trial, maybe you've read The Metamorphosis, kind of relies on very absurd premises and things uh, in order to kind of make points. And if you've seen, or if you've heard of uh, Waiting for Godot, it is a play where two guys stand around talking for several hours, and every time they're going to leave, they have to wait for Godot. And the play ends, and Good Godot never comes. And so it's meant to get you to think about, are we all just waiting around for something that will never happen and will never come? And so, again, a lot, World War I has a huge impact on the way people are starting to think about life in the 20th century. And so philosophers start asking questions. Is human existence pointless? Is civilization destined to fail? How can civilization be saved? And this creates a heck of a lot of conflict around the world. You have giant political movements rising. Uh, fascism in Italy, then uh, Nazism in Germany. You have the communist revolutions that are happening um, in China. In Japan, uh, the military is going to take a tighter hold in order to try to solve the economic problems that are going to come. And so all around the world, you have people looking now to new solutions to their problems. But in the United States, uh, the President Warren G. Harding promised the country everything was going to return back to normal. And so Americans are trying to forget what had happened, largely because they can't. The war was not fought on their territory. They lost a lot fewer people than other countries involved. And so Americans, instead of looking out at the world, are going to start focusing inward on what is happening in the country. 
And so I asked you guys to read The Age of Play. So you might want to pause the video here for a minute and try to think about that reading or take a look back of it and think about why the 20s were called The Age of Play, what were those examples, and kind of how did things change in the United States. And so, again, kind of just to underscore the reading, or if you didn't do the reading, then I guess I'm helping you out with it. Um, the age of play is kind of this idea where more and more people have more free time, and they also have more money. And so the economic prosperity means people now have time to spend, time and money to spend on entertainment. And so culture kind of becomes an escape. <clears throat> the rise of film, professional sports, music, even crossword puzzles in the newspaper all are kind of reflecting this attitude that Americans are starting to put more and more and more importance on their entertainment, a trend that I think is very kind of easy to see today. And so you have the first pro sports leagues being founded. Uh, you have dance halls like the Aragon Ballroom, um, the Cotton Club, and others that are playing jazz and dance music, and people are going out uh, in their hundreds just to enjoy this. You have people around the block for movies. Uh, if you check that marquee, John Barrymore, if you've heard of Drew Barrymore, uh, same family. And so film stars are going to be born, and Americans are going to still love the movies. And now, because you moved to a city, there's also this desire to now leave the city. And so Americans go camping for the first time. And so a lot of these kind of things are going to be new. And so these dramatic changes in American society uh, are going to be big. More people are going to live in cities than in the country. Total wealth is going to double. And that industrial boom is going to lead to a lot of changes in just how we're going to live. Uh, women, too, in this time are going to have massive leaps and bounds after the experience of World War I and the long fight for suffrage. And a lot of this is going to be rooted essentially in economic opportunities. Uh, women enter the workforce in larger numbers than ever before. They have access to higher salaries than ever before. And so because of that, they ha get economic liberation. And once you have your own money, no one can really tell you what to do. Uh, and also women are going to become wealthy in this time. Um, a few women entrepreneurs are going to become big. Just one example is Elizabeth Arden. Uh, she built a cosmetics empire in the 20s. And because she identified very early that the cheaper you can make a product, the more you can make that product seem somewhat essential. And so my favorite quote from her is, nothing that costs only a dollar is not worth having. And that kind of shows us. So think about this. How many impulse buy items did you used to buy when we were allowed to go outside uh, to pick out because there were only a few dollars? Probably a lot. And so with uh, kind of that economic liberation is going to come cultural freedom. A lot of you guys commented um, on some of the photographs in the 1920s. And so you've probably heard about flappers. And it's kind of just this idea that women are now able to make a lot more decisions for themselves. And so that is going to take hold uh, kind of all over the world, but especially in the United States. Uh, you have women movie stars popularizing um, the short haircuts. You can also see uh, in the car there that man in the back looks awfully uncomfortable. That's because the idea of women driving is kind of still a crazy idea in the 1920s. So a couple other major changes are going to be to mass media. Um, this is going to be the era of the radio and film which is actually going to create a mass culture. Think about the idea that you could talk about the Avengers to probably anybody in the world, and they would know what you were talking about, or Mickey Mouse, or Star Wars. And that's the idea of mass culture. And so it starts on the radio, uh, and then it moves on to film. So all these movies and things that I'm going to mention, you can find these all on YouTube. Uh, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon was Steamboat Willie in 1928. Uh, Americans used to gather around the radio to listen to shows. So before you would watch soap operas, they would have them, but they would just be on the radio, and you would listen to the people's voices inside of the studio. Uh, and so people would broadcast shows, news, sports, <clears throat> and it's going to really change the way that Americans are going to consume information. Um, then film begins to take off. And so a couple of major films, The Passion of Joan of Arc, is the first historical drama. The Kid by Charlie Chaplin is considered kind of one of the funniest movies of the silent film era. Uh, the Jazz Singer, complete with blackface, becomes the first picture with sound in 1927. Um, Sci-fi is going to be ushered in in this era with the film Metropolis, where we imagine a future in which most people work underground, and it really has a big impact on future sci-fi. Uh, 
Uh, we have romances like The Sheik in 1921, horror movies like 1922's Nosferatu. And so all of this is changing cultural norms in an incredible way. We have kind of a generational gap. We have the automobile, which means freedom for both young and old people. And so what you have is a very, very big shift away from kind of more traditional ways and more towards this idea of we're young, we're going to party, and we're going to enjoy it. Even alcohol consumption rises, despite alcohol being illegal throughout the 1920s. And so we're looking at a society that's going through a huge amount of changes. So at this point, if you're going to do this in a couple sittings, which at this point I might recommend, uh, this is a good place to stop. Because then we're going to get into kind of some other social issues outside of Americans' relationships with their entertainment. So a big issue that we have to discuss is going to be the issues of race in the 1920s. And so a big thing that's going to cause these issues is going to be the increased immigration from Mexico and the migration of African Americans into northern cities and around the south. But we'll start by looking at, this, at the southern border. And during uh, the Mexican Revolution in 1911, up through the World War I Bracero program, uh, over a million persons from Mexico immigrate into the United States. Um, a lot of them are pushed out by civil wars. Um, the Cristero War is in there, a few others. And so a lot of these people are going to be kind of moving where they believe it is safer, which is going to be the United States. However, this creates two separate conflicts. One conflict is between white Americans and these new arrivals, but the second conflict is actually between these new immigrants and the established Mexican Americans in California and the Southwest. And so there's actually a lot of conflict over these newcomers that are changing the demographics of Mexican Americans in the U.S. Uh, secondly, this is where you start to see the communities of Mexican Americans exist in northern cities, in Detroit, and yes, in Chicago. Um, a lot of immigration is going to happen into those areas because simply that is where the jobs are going to be. However, this creates a lot of violent backlash. Even though we usually associate things like lynching and mob violence with African Americans, uh, in this era, an equal amount by percentage of Mexican Americans uh, were murdered and lynched by white mobs. And so it's a very kind of sad chapter in our history, but it shows just how violent these racial conflicts would become. And so some Mexican Americans, um, in retaliation to this violence, actually armed themselves and they tried to carry out what they called the Plan de San Diego, which was basically a rebellion to kill all Anglo men and reclaim the Southwest. Um, they are successful in killing 21 people. They destroy a lot of property, but ultimately the Texas Rangers catch them at this pool hall and they end up killing all of those that rebel, at least that were caught there. And so it's going to be kind of a very, very violent history as America struggles with how to incorporate these new persons into the society. And so unfortunately at this time, um, the immigrant experience is going to be characterized by exploitation. Um, just like it is in northern cities, it's going to be in the southwest and in the California fields. Um, a new term is coined in America called Spanish American, which allows for um, people to essentially discriminate in practice, even though Mexican Americans were considered white by law. And so this is a way to kind of still segregate people without having it be legal technically. Um, and the reason that, that this is largely not an issue is because most Americans don't deal with these issues. Unless you're living in kind of an urban center like Chicago or Detroit, or if you're living in the Southwest, you're largely ignorant to what a Mexican American even is. And so a lot of this violence is really gonna go unprosecuted. Um, also, what's going to happen uh, is one of the first massive waves of deportation um, of Latino immigrants in the United States. Uh, Post-World War I into the 1920s and Great Depression, a lot of persons who had come in as workers legally were then deported. Um, in this time period, uh, approximately 450,000 to a million of these people were deported, and uh, recent estimates and research suggest that up to about 60% of these people were actually U.S. citizens. And so this is a time, again, where justice is not necessarily colorblind. And so we'll then kind of pivot uh, to African Americans to follow up with the Langston Hughes reading that you guys made. So uh, racism is going to dominate the black experience both in the North and the South. 
And a lot of those urban northern conflicts are going to be caused by the Great Migration, where large numbers of African Americans kind of fleeing the post-Reconstruction South and sharecropping are going to move into areas like New York and Har in Harlem. And this is actually going to create a huge explosion of black culture. And for a lot of people, the Harlem Renaissance is kind of one of the proudest cultural moments in American history. So if you take a look at this map, it's going to kind of tell the whole story. Um, if you don't like where you are, you need to go somewhere. And if you check where people are going, they're going where there is work. They're going to major cities, major urban areas. And this kind of sets the tone for the large population of African Americans in cities today. It kind of starts in this era. But... As this is happening, America is still pretty much, um, racism is pretty much the norm. And so almost you don't even call it racism. Um, one of the most brilliant movies ever made and the most popular movie of its time was D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation. It's an epic film. It changed cinema, cinema forever. But the main plot was essentially about Klansmen who defend white womanhood during Reconstruction. And in the climactic scene, um, a black man, a sorry, a man in blackface who is meant to have like crazy eyes, is stopped by the Ku Klux Klan from raping a white woman. And so this was shown at the White House. The president loved it. Americans were kind of big fans of it. And so it kind of tells you a little bit just about what was normalized at the time. Didn't really seem to be any problem with this sort of a film. Um, in Chicago, we're going to have uh, some of the worst racial violence in the country's history. Um, if you look up the 1919 Chicago race riots, the city burns for several days because one kid swam into the wrong part of the water from the black beach into the white beach. And so the city burned for several days. People were killed. Um, and over 500 people are going to be injured. Property was destroyed. And this is one of the legacies of Chicago violence. Uh, in 1921, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the most wealthy black community in the country, they even called it Black Wall Street. Uh, it was actually called Greenwood. Um, it was a community that had doctors, lawyers, um, investment firms that held stocks in Wall Street. But um, a mob whipped up by white supremacists are going to actually attack and destroy this entire neighborhood, uh, killing 39 people, injuring 800, and destroying the entire community and everything that they had built. Um, by the time this was over, there was no more Greenwood neighborhood. There was no more Black Wall Street. And so in this time, again, racial violence is almost commonplace, and in many times it's not even prosecuted. Which leads um, to some interesting thought amongst uh, politicians in the black community. Uh, this guy's name is Marcus Garvey. You won't hear his name too much, but he was the first black nationalist. The idea that basically uh, African Americans should have their own country set up apart because white society was never going to let them be involved. And so he actually advocated the idea of going back to Africa, setting up a country, and then trying to kind of work with all the other African countries uh, to overcome what he saw as systemic racism in the world. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois also wrote extensively about being black in America, in which he said that you always, as a black man in this time, had to think about who you are, but also how the other is seeing you. And so you are an American, you are who you think you are, but then you are also seen as a society as just a Negro. And so his idea was that kind of the societal expectations, impact stereotypes, created a lot of internal conflict uh, within persons in American society. Um, a lot of people picked up um, on these ideas, and a lot of writers, uh, James Baldwin, uh, Tanishi Coates, have picked up on these themes to kind of talk about what it means to live in a society that has kind of such negative stereotypes of you as an individual. Um, you know, you guys read Song of Solomon. This comes up in uh, Richard Wright's work. And so there's a rich literary tradition of kind of dealing with these intellectual issues of what it means to be in America when Americans don't, when all Americans don't consider you to be kind of equal. Um, and so a lot of these thought processes blow out of the Harlem Renaissance, where you have paintings um, like Chicago, you have Archibald Motley, Bronzeville at Night, one of my all-time favorite paintings, um, in which kind of people are starting to develop a unique culture. And so these scenes, kind of lively, big colors, almost seems to be kind of bursting with energy, is going to create a new style of art that a lot of American artists are going to borrow from throughout the years.
And so in Chicago, what develops because of segregation in northern cities is going to be the Black Belt. If you take a look at this map, uh, you might notice that the Black Belt is largely still there. Um, because of boundaries that were set up um, kind of over time, uh, African Americans as well as Latino Americans were not allowed to move into a lot of neighborhoods. And so the Black Belt that was established in the 1920s is still the Black Belt in 2020. And that's kind of a very interesting trend, but it really has its roots in history. Um, music is going to become very big in America. Uh, jazz becomes America's music. Um, literature in the black community is going to explode with Langston Hughes and a couple of other writers. Um, Elaine Locke is going to write The New Negro, in which um, they kind of argue that racial pride is going to be the answer to fighting racism. And so there's a lot of these ideas that are developing in the 1920s that are going to kind of keep gaining momentum until the civil rights movement um, of the kind of 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So again, so now we're going to kind of go into part three of this. So again, if you're doing it in parts, now might be a good time to stop. But uh, I just kind of want to drop a lot of these breadcrumbs that you guys might find them interesting. So now we're going to get into all the other great social conflicts in the 1920s. So the 1920s, we kind of picture it as like a partying age, but actually it's one of the most controversial ages I think that we've ever had as a country. We were more conflicted in this time than almost any other. And so a lot of this comes down to age-old battles. Intellectuals versus the common man. Science versus religion. Urban versus rural. New versus old. And so all of these battles are going to be fought over a lot of different changes that are happening. It's going to be fought over the role of women, over whether jazz is bad for kids, um, over the morality of the youth culture and whether they were going to destroy America, um, prohibition alcohol, uh, the Harlem Renaissance versus the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, immigrants versus, the, versus nativism. And so these battle lines are kind of everywhere, but, in, but they're fighting along the same lines that we kind of argue about today. But uh, 1925, the ultimate showdown between science and religion in the 20s happens with the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, in Tennessee, John Scopes, a teacher, was uh, arrested for teaching evolution in the public school, violating a law. And so they put him on trial, and it was national news. And so it was science versus religion. Two of the most famous attorneys in the whole country, Clarence Darrow and Williams Jennings Bryan, like, were the two lawyers in the case. And it became a huge pop culture sensation, which allowed all the people who were kind of on either side to just kind of hem and haw for months and months while this went on. Uh, if you're kind of interested in a, in this story, there's a great movie made. It's called Inherit the Wind. It's also a stage play. Um, I believe this is available on YouTube as well. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Uh, then we have a very, very big anti-immigrant wave in the 1920s. You guys saw a little bit of this uh, with those political cartoons, but we're going to ramp it up a little bit in the 1920s. Uh, the National Origins Act is the law that is going to end open border immigration. Now we're going to have a quota system that is going to limit the number of immigrants that can come by their country of origin. And so the reason for that, the goal, was really to limit immigration from certain countries. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, there was increased terrorism in the world. Um, the bombing of Wall Street was blamed on international terrorists, um, the assassination of um, a couple of major officials in Europe. Um, there's a red scare of communist revolution. Um, the government is doing Palmer raids, kind of trying to round up un-American people. And so there really is kind of this sense that the American way of life is in danger, and so the Retaliation, then, is against immigrants who are considered to be foreigners. And so, in a lot of ways, um, the origins of our current immigration problems, uh, they really start uh, in this era, in the 1920s. Uh, we then get into the age-old fight between the old and the new, between the young and the old. And so, there's a really big kind of battle between the generations here. Where, on the one hand, we have people who had pushed for years and are trying to enforce prohibition. That morality will bring America back. That we can solve our problems if we ban alcohol. And so we actually did. We had 13 years in this country where alcohol was illegal. And so, on, in that sense, you can tell just how powerful this movement had become. They changed the Constitution to ban alcohol. 
That's incredible, right? Constitution doesn't get changed very often. And so, on the other hand, you had a lot of people who took this era as the Roaring Twenties. And so, while some people were pouring out beer into the streets, other people were protesting for it, and other people were just going to underground illegal bars and drinking whatever they could find at whatever prices the bar was going to give them. And so, in a lot of ways, this shows the major conflicts in American society between people and what they really believe is best for the country. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure you guys are interested in this, uh, banning alcohol is really going to empower organized crime in Chicago. Um, over time, Al Capone takes out all his competition, and uh, he becomes the king bootlegger bringing in booze into Chicago. And so, again, that's kind of something you can look up on your own, but it's an interesting story. On the other hand, let's talk about the backlash to the Harlem Renaissance, as well as increased immigration. So, on the one hand, um, the Ku Klux Klan had been dead. But in the 19-teens and 20s, it is actually going to come back in a major way. Um, fearing jazz music corrupting their children. Fearing the success that African Americans were having in some places. Um, fearing the mainstream acceptance, even, of some black entertainers. Um, the Ku Klux Klan is going to recruit based on an idea of 100% Americanism. And so anyone who's a threat to America, which includes blacks, Mexican-Americans, Catholics, Jews, any immigrants, um, they are all going to be added to this list of people that are destroying America. And so they're going to really take advantage of uh, competition in the cities for jobs, um, kind of uncertainty, and to expand very heavily into urban areas and into the north. Um, the state of Indiana, you can look this up, was once pretty much run by politicians affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan. And the KKK, ironically, actually becomes one of the biggest enforcers of prohibition, where they're willing to use terror to strike fear into people. They were also willing to use terror to stop alcohol from being sold. And so the Ku Klux Klan reinvents itself now, not as an organization of Confederates, but as an organization protecting American morality. They are the white knight, the white dragon, that is protecting American values for everyone. And so they would even have these cards that you would drop um, at restaurants that people would say, will kind of identify themselves to you as being a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And so the irony here, that quote, is from Abraham Lincoln. Great irony here. Um, and so the Ku Klux Klan becomes really powerful, uh, culminating in their March on Washington, um, in which they show up in force in full Klan regalia with no hoods showing their faces as a show of power. And so every change that's going to happen in society is going to have a major backlash. And so what we see with this is the Ku Klux Klan. On the other hand, um, just to kind of wrap this up here, um, the 1920s had some great times, but also had some bad times. Um, there were culture wars. Didn't really have a lot of progress on race or religion issues or gender issues. Sorry, a little progress on race issues. Some progress on gender issues. Um, rise of organized crime. So in a lot of ways, the 20s is really not all it's cracked up to be. And it's really not going to be all it's cracked up to be when all of that great spending, all that fun, is going to come back to destroy the economy. What's going to end up happening is Americans are going to produce too many things. They're going to borrow too much money to buy too many things. They're not going to save money. And then when the economy slows down at the end of the 1920s, everything is going to come into a crashing, crashing halt. And so... We'll talk about that a little bit later, but just understand that the bigger the up, unfortunately, the harder the down.